So thank you very much, ma'am, for putting this on recording. And I think everybody else will be falling in as they go. Ron, did you figure out how to turn your microphone on yet? David, are you there? Yes. There okay. he is. There he Hi. is. Okay, great. And Ron, are you there? I'm here. Do you hear me? Yeah, uh, we hear you. Very good, gentlemen. We're going to go ahead and get started because I know the rest of the team is probably out there watching the Stanley Cup, which, by the way, we're leading uh -huh. four to nothing. We being, of course, the Vegas Golden Knights. And uh, what I'll do is uh, this is Tana Talk. A Journey of Discovery About All Things Antana, and it is a production of the Antana Whisper. That's Rudy Wiedemann, K7RAW, and supported and sponsored by the Las Vegas Radio Amateur Club. So on that note, um, one thing that's going to be happening this evening is it, you will not have to see Rudy's face tonight. <laughs> which um we were having fun with that in rehearsal so you'll have to hold with us on that and hopefully i won't make the same faux pas but um rudy is going to have uh, complete demonstrations on here and he has told me that he has a cavalcade of demonstrations for us this evening specifically on the the nano vna and uh what you can do with it and everything so we're gonna what i'm gonna do is we're going to turn that over to Rudy right now and get him going. Uh, and he is actually, Rudy is represented by two alligator clips, a black one <laughs> and a red one. <laughs> so um, feel free at any time ah. to talk to the two clips. <laughs> yes. Talk to the hand. Yeah, there you <laughs> go. <laughs> anyway, um, so before we get going, uh, and before I give you a uh, an agenda of what we're going to do tonight, which, by the way, is going to be great stuff. It's going to be a lot of fun. Um, question, do, has everybody seen 5 Alpha? Yes. Yes. I heard a yes and a head shaking. And uh... Okay, great. And we got Craig coming in. Craig, you're muted. Feel free to open up your mic, Craig, because this will be an open discussion since uh, Rudy, we will not see Rudy, but we will see his hand and his alligator clips uh, doing their demonstration for da, us. Da, 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 da. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so Craig, um, have you seen 5 Alpha? No, I have not. Okay. Well, I've been gone uh, all weekend and I haven't had a chance to look at it. I would suggest you after this, you might want to take a look at five alpha. Uh, it'll give you more uh, underpinning background to to what's going on here tonight. But um, anyway, let's uh, let's get going. First question: Does anybody have any questions on the content of what I covered in five alpha? I just have one question, Rudy. I don't understand why is it that it's important to recalibrate. The nano VNA every time you go to use it. <laughs> well, I'm sorry, Ron, I'm that's a that's a great question. What happens is, you know, if you calibrate it and you fire it back up again and you don't make any changes, like the number of points or the range, spectrum range or anything like that, you're generally good to go. The the nano will remember in in its uh, non volatile memory the calibration. The thing about it is, though, that I find in most cases whenever I uh, do something with the nano. I'm changing something that would be a, would affect the calibration. I change this now frequency range. I'll change a scale. I'll change a number of points, uh, and a bunch of stuff like that. So that's what drives the recalibration. Or I'll have different clip leads. I'll use different types of clip leads. I may I may be testing something right here. I may be testing something way out here. I might be testing something way at the end of a of a coax out there, 50 feet out. Yeah. I think, Ron, one thing that you have to understand about this is this is not an analog device. This is a digital device, which means it is actually going to remember the last little micro movement that happened and uh, can affect uh, something going forward if you don't recalibrate. You know, in, in analog, you can you pretty well go to zero really quick, but in digital, it holds it. 
And that's the big difference. So uh, it's the same thing that happens on SDR and, and, and other things, that the Nano actually is a digital device. And digital tends to remember the last little thing that happened. And you may not remember it, but it sure as heck does. Okay, so Jack. just remember, if you, if you change anything that might be important, like frequency or point number of points, uh, or, uh, those are the two main things or the type of connections you're using to do the calibration. If you're changing any of those, you want to recalibrate. Otherwise, you leave it. Okay, got it. Thank you. Any other questions before we move into tonight's demo? Okay, none heard. Then in that case, I'm going to put the uh, five alpha presentation away. And I'm going to bring up the five Bravo presentation real quick. And I'm just going to share this with you. Hang on a second. Let me just share. Uh, let's see. Okay. Screen share. I got to remember how to do this. Yeah. Don't, uh, do, the, don't do the screen. Don't do screenshot or you no. want to share your app. Yep. Okay. Are you seeing? Yeah, you got uh, mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. All right. So let's see. I think that should go into full screen mode now. Yep. Is, okay. That works. So here's the agenda. We're going to talk real quickly about setting up the nano VNA and the calibration. We're not going to do it because I'm all calibrated. And in the interest of time, I've pre calibrated everything. But I'm going to kind of walk you through some of the uh, um, important factors to keep in mind when you set up the nano VNA and do calibration. And then we're going to use nano VNA saver because this bloody nano VNA, although I love it to death, um, it uh, using it with a camera washes out the menu. So when I select the menu, you can't see what the hell is written on the menu. So that's no good. So we're going to use, it's time to use the nano VNA saver software because it's pretty cool. And I'll show you that tonight too. So using the nano VNA saber, we're going to do a couple of fun things. We're going to measure some unun ratios. Why is that important? Because if you want to wind a custom unun or ballon, you want to be able to make sure you got the right ratio, right? And if you want to do a, a multi-ratio ballon or unun, then you can measure the ratio for every tap that you, you pick off of it. And you'll see how to do that. We'll also compare several different common mode chokes and we'll see the actual performance of real live common mode chokes of some practical chokes. And you're gonna be shocked. I got news for you. Then we're gonna measure a notch filter, which is really kind of fun. And then we're gonna measure some inductors and actually uh, uh, show you how to do that, which is very handy. If you wanna build filters or, or anything along those lines, resonant circuits, You'll see exactly how to do that with the Nano and why it works. So with that, let's get going. Let me get out of that and let me get back to the camera mode. All right, let me stop the sharing and we're back here to my camera. Okay, everybody see my camera? Yep. Yes. Okay, so uh, let me bring up Nano VNA and Nano VNA saver, and let me share that now so that I can give you a quick cooks tour. Everybody see that now? Perfect. Okay. Yes. So I'm going to prove to you that we have a good calibration. Right now, my test leads, my alligator clips are open, if you've noticed that before. So that's why I see a whole bunch of dots here at the three o'clock position. Now I'm going to short them out and everything. And I'm gonna to have to rescan up here. Now, just to show you, this up here in the upper left-hand corner is the starting frequency and the ending frequency, just like you would put into your stimulus in the Nano VNA. But you can either have it in continuous sweep mode. Right now I've got it in single sweep mode. You can have it in continuous sweep, but continuous sweep gets a little bit confusing or busy. So we're just gonna do a single sweep and notice with the single sweep, notice my dot over here on the Smith chart is over at the nine o'clock position as it exactly should be when it's shorted out, right? Everybody with me? Mm -hmm. 
Okay, so I'm just proving to you that we have a good calibration. And now I'm hooking up a precision 50 ohm resistor to those alligator leads because we're using everything at the end of the alligator leads. And I'm going to do another sweep. And it should be right dead center of the Smith chart. Boom, there it is. So I have a good calibration. Everybody agree? Yep. Okay, cool. So now I want to explain something. Uh, we've got a, an LDG anon, off the shelf anon, four to one anon, coax in and antenna out. Okay. The purpose of the anon, if you recall, is to change the impedance from my coax to the antenna for a particular ratio, in this case, 200 ohms, four times 50, right? Everybody with me? Yes. Yep. Ron? Yes. Okay, good. So what I wanna show you is now I simply, very simple, I simulated approximately 200 ohm resistance at the antenna, I'm going to show you this. Can you see the reading on the meter? No. Okay. Um, let's see. How about now? Mm. A little tiny. Yeah. Okay. So I'm going to put it in ohm mode, and I'm going to show you. I'm reading about 220 ohms. Okay. And guess what? This is a red, red, brown resistor, okay? Uh, you can't quite see it from there, but it's red, red, brown, which is 220, duh, okay? So well, it's really what, pretty close to what it says. I'm gonna stick it onto the terminals of the un on nice and snug. And then I'm simply going to measure the resistance from the impedance value off the Smith chart. Okay, by plugging it in, let me just put my meter away here. I'm going to unscrew this and I have a handy dandy PL259 end of this. So I'm gonna plug that into there, just like my coax. Okay. And I'm gonna do a quick scan with the nano VNA saver. And I want you to notice something. Look, look at the SWR. It's way down here, a darn near flat line. Okay. So what the heck does this mean? SWR1 across the entire spectrum. Well, what it means is that if I dub, if I look at the SW or the impedance value at some frequency, let's say right. Uh, right around here at the middle of the Smith chart, right dead center, some dot right in the middle of the center, which is around six megahertz, six, seven megahertz. Or better yet, let's look at 14 megahertz, something around 20 meters, okay? If I look good up here at marker one, okay? The top of the three groups on the left of the uh, uh, nano VNA saver. I see a, my dot that I picked, my data point was 14070 down in the CW band of 20 meters, okay? And my impedance is 53.6. Well, that's pretty doggone close to 50 ohm. Now, I'm going to divide my 220 ohm resistor by the 53.6. 220 divided by 53.6, and I get, lo and behold, dun da 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 4.1. 4.1 to 1 as a ratio. Pretty doggone close. Good enough for government work, guys. Okay, you see how that works? Isn't that cool? Mm -hmm. So I'll show it to you that it works on a 9 to 1 ratio, which I happen to have. And here I've got a 330 ohm resistor. Now, it's not critical what resistance you use. You just have to use that and divide the resistance value that you measure with your nano DNA, okay, into uh, divide that resistor by the resistance value you measure 
at whatever frequency. Now, notice that the the one to one uh, SWR is not perfect and it's not perfectly flat. And in fact, it has, I think this data point right here is a flyer. I think it's a, a data flyer. Let's do another sweep and just see what happens here. Okay, so now with that, notice I've got a very different curve, okay? And that's because I've got a nine to one and it's a nine to one for 50 ohms in, I should be expecting 450 ohms resistance at the antenna, but I've only got 330 ohms. So let's do the math. Let's divide, let's see what that number is. Okay, and it is 35 ohms. Okay, so 35 ohms, which is why I'm getting an SWR above one, because it's 50 divided by 35, which is about one and a half, right? So if I divide 330 ohms, which is my load, divided by 35 ohms, I get, lo and behold, 9.4. Not too far off. This may be a 9.0, might be a 9.3, might be a 9.6. I don't know, but right now I'm measuring about 9.4. So the, uh, and if you really want to be precise, get a precision resistor, measure it, double check it, and you'll, you'll be even more precise than that. So gentlemen, that is how you test the, the ratio of any anon or balan that you make or buy for that matter. Okay, any questions? You know, why is there a reactance involved in this, Rudy? Well, okay, so most of these uh, anons will have a small capacitor inside, okay? Uh, at the uh, at, at the feed end, at the coax end. If you recall, Ron, uh, I think that was you, Ron, who asked. Yeah. Well, what, uh, if you recall, a, an anon can get us almost purely along the equator of the Smith chart to get us either up or down in resistance, but it does have some impedance or some some uh, inductance nature to it some residual inductance so to get that inductance dialed out they typically put a small capacitor of around 100 120 picofarad at the coax input side of the of the anon or balloon and that's what you're seeing the effect of right here and that's why this is not a perfect dot but it's it's still a little bit on the capacitive reactance side Okay, makes sense? Yeah, thank you. Okay, all right, so let's move on. So with that, let's, uh, let's see, what was, there was uh, the next thing I was gonna cover. Hang on a second, I gotta look at my agenda. Okay, so we've done the nano VNA saver. Uh, we measured the unknown ratio, let's move to Common mode chokes, one of my favorite subjects. Okay. So um, I've got several common mode chokes here. And uh, here is one that I built. And it is very equivalent to the coax weld. This is an FT240 31. That means it's a ferrite toroid with a 2.4 inch OD. That's where the 240 comes from. And it's a mixed 31 material that's made from, okay? And you can see the 31 marked on it with Sharpie. Um, remember to mark it with a Sharpie because 43s are the same color. <laughs> you use 43s for balance and unarms, you use 31s for common mode chokes. And I've got about six turns on one side and about six turns, actually I got like seven turns on this side, six turns on the other side, all right? And this is a bifiler turn, two, um, in this case, 16 gauge uh, magnet wire, okay, by, um, coated magnet wire, wrapped six times, I cut across and wrap it the other way six times. Now, why do people wrap it the other way? Well, because if you've got something coming in from a connector here on a box and you want it to go out to another connector on the other side of the box, it's a nice way to, to get the input on the other side from the output. Uh, you don't have to do it that way. You could wrap it the same way all the way back around and have the tails coming out the same side that the inputs came in from. So it doesn't really matter which way you want. It's just for physical 
uh, assembly uh, purposes or use purposes. Okay, so this is going to be what we measure is going to be the equivalent of a coax wound six turns on one side, cross over six turns the other way on the other side, and out to your antenna. Okay, with a little tiny short tail. And you can wind those with uh, RG8X, for example, onto an FT240 with the connectors on, believe it or not. Okay, so now what we have to do is we have to change our scale, our displays here from SWR to log mag. Now, what is log mag and why am I doing it? What I'm doing is I'm looking at, I'll be looking at, instead of SWR, I'll be looking, oh, come on. Clicking. Let me click on this here. Okay. Let me drop down and let me go to 2 1 log mag. Uh, hold on a second. Oh, that's very interesting. Uh, that's really interesting. Ah, there it is. Okay, log mag. I thought it was up there. Okay, so now what we have to do, when you're measuring a common mode chain, it's a very simple concept. Don't get confused. Don't get BS by other people. This is the input. This is the output. Two leads in, two leads out, okay? Common mode means that coming, usually coming back from your antenna, back to your rig, I'm getting current down both leads, okay? And usually the shield especially, okay? Whatever's gonna be the shield. But I've got uh, current coming back down the shield and the center tap of my coax. So I'm com got current coming down both leads, and coming out both leads into my rig. And that's what leads to mic bite and RF in the shack and all kinds of noise and interference and other problems. So to test this out, what I have to do is I have to, let me put on this little alligator clip, okay? And I have to connect the ground leads of my, S, my port one to port two on my nano VNA. All right, and then I connect my other center lead to both inputs like so, and I connect my other center lead going into the S1P or S2P or two like so, okay? And let's do a rescan on this. Okay, so what I'd like you to take a look at, if you can see it, can you see the scale here on the left? Zero, minus 20 dB, minus 40 dB, minus 60 dB, minus 80 dB. Everybody see that? Yep. This greenish, bluish trace, that is the suppression. So from three megahertz to about 18 megahertz, I've got well below 60, negative 60 dB of suppression of that common mode noise. And at the worst case up here at 30 megahertz, I've got at least a negative 40 dB of suppression. That's uh, determined by the uh, mix 31's characteristics of this frequency characteristic, okay? That determines the shape of this curve. So it actually is more effective down from three to 18 megahertz, and then it slowly uh, loses its effectiveness, but still quite good. So the, what you're looking for is negative 25 at least. And we're down here in negative 40, worst case at 30 megahertz. So I would say that this is a pretty damn good common mode choke. Wouldn't you all agree? <laughs> yep, yep. Okay, cool. So now let's have some fun. Um, Rudy, Rudy, before yeah. you go, go any further, how would you test uh, clip-on uh, tow rides that, in, in that configuration? 
You mean like these? Yeah. Is that the fun we're going to have? You anticipated my oh. next move. <laughs> okay. Very on. Okay. All right. So what we're going to do is we're going to leave those black leads connected. And we're going to unclip the center top leads. We're going to set our choke aside. And now I want to show you something quite remarkable. Anybody want to take a count on the number of clip-on ferrites I've got on here? Looks like about 10. 11. 11. I have 11 clip-on leads. I kind of went overboard, as many as I could fit on this little pigtail adapter. Okay? Let's see how 11 clip-on leads do with the same test, shall we? So I'm simply going to flip this across from the... Hold on a second. I got to get this back a little further so the jaws can open up. A little further. There we go. There's one side. And here's the other side. All right. Let's do a rescan. Look at that. It goes up to minus 40, but it's somewhat better uh, or somewhat worse than the other one. But it's not half bad. It's not half bad. Okay. What we can do, if you'd like, is we can go backwards and unclip some of these things and uh, pop them off here real quick. Get the thumbnail going. Two down. Three down. Let's see what it looks like with me down. You know what? I think I'm going to put it on continuous scan. It's rescan businesses. Uh -huh. Alone. Let's go to continuous scan. All right. So now that we're going to have to Oh, hold on. Let's, I just lost my connection. That's right. There we go. All right. So you can see that it's going up. Okay. So let's pop off a few more. Pop off a few more. Let's move one, two, three, four, five. Let's do five of them. I'm pulling off six out of the 11. And uh, let's see, is it rescanned? Yeah, sure, it looks like it's rescanned. Okay. okay, so um, that's interesting. Um, you have to make sure you do a calibration out here. What I did is I uh, calibrated with the open short and the resistor, okay, uh, at these end clips. If you don't do that, if you calibrate anywhere else in the system, like back here, and then you add all the little clips and leads, it can really throw you off. So you don't want to do that. You want to do it really in situ. So now let's have some fun and look at a, at a commercial clip-on adapter. This is a, a radio wave D1.1 ISO, all right? And with this, we actually have SO239 we have to connect to. So we'll pull the clips off and we'll hook it up directly to. You know what I'm going to need? Hang on a second. I need some more than the very end. SO239. Handy, handy, handy. Oh. I think we need to get Rudy a lapel microphone so when he's going out searching for his cables, we can hear him. Yes, yes. Um, 
All right, so I've got my right angle connectors one side. All right, here we go. 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 All right. So let's connect that up. One side, and then get the other side. Let's get that nice and snug. All right, so it should be rescanning. And now notice something minus thirty, minus forty. Yeah, where's my cursor? There's my cursor. Okay, so it's uh, it's not too bad. It's minus forty here for the uh, for this commercial guy. So I would say this would work. Again, you want to be at least minus twenty five, which is uh, this is why I didn't want it to rescan because when it rescans, sometimes it sees some noise in there and uh, changes scale, which drives me nuts. Let's just go back here to single sweep, single scan. Okay, so now it's not going to move. So minus 25 is right about here, okay? That's the minimum you want to see. So we're still doing okay with this, all right? We're still doing okay with this guy. Um, I, I've had worse results in the past only because I wasn't quite careful enough with the way I calibrated it my whole setup and uh if you do it right then you can generally believe your your results much better okay so we tested common mode chokes any questions about testing common mode chokes don't know all at once well, Rudy, is there any limitations? As, as the clip-ons actually, I would think, have no limitations on power. Is that correct? Pretty much so, yeah. And but, here, the nano VNA puts out only a few milliwatts, so it's right. really not really that. Uh, but if you bought if you bought a commercial one, it's normally rated at some maximum power level that you can run through it. Right. Oh, you mean the the common mode choke? Yeah, but not the nano. Uh, yeah, uh, this one's rated at 100 watts. Uh, so good, that's a great question. Let's talk about uh, power limitation to chokes. So you see this guy, all right? Well, it's a uh, it's a single core. If you this is good for 100 watts, easy, especially with the 16 gauge solid copper wire. Okay. What typically happens when these things when you try to put more power into it is First of all, the, the core will saturate, the magnetic field will saturate, and it becomes less and less effective. In fact, it rolls over, it becomes less effective if it gets hot. Kind of like a magnet, right? When magnets get hot, they get less effective, if you recall. Mm -hmm. um, secondly, it gets hot and may eventually crack the core if you really drive it apart. If you want to go to like 300 watts, you can double stack the core and wind around both cores together, okay? Oh. Just sandwich them together and wind it as a double core. And in fact, I'll show you in a small version, okay, of doing that. Can you, you guys see that? Yes. Yep. Okay. So that's an example of getting more inductance as well as getting more power capability. And if you want to keep the same inductance, well, you'd have fewer turns. If you double the core, you don't need as many turns. <clears throat> so that kind of leads to my next discussion. And that is, uh, let's hold on a second. Let's just follow my agenda. Okay, so we did the chokes. All right, let, so let's have some fun. Now that we're in the log, 
mag scale here with the blue line, okay? Let's measure a notch filter in line. Okay, so this guy is one of these, it's a handy dandy little RF demo kit for the Milan DNA. And they've got all kinds of nice little components on there. They've got inductors and capacitors, short load, open for calibration. They've got attenuators. They've got a 32-ohm load, a 75-ohm load. And they've got different filters here. So I've hooked this up to a filter, okay? And we're going to see how close to 6.5 megahertz this notch filter actually performs. Okay? So we're going to actually measure this notch filter. So with this, I'm going to... Going to cheat a little bit by pulling these connectors off. It won't affect the calibration too much since we're not trying to measure to absolute numbers. We're just looking for relative numbers here. But let me hook these two handy dandy SMA connectors up. So nicely. By the way, these are UFL connectors. I don't know if you can see these guys, but these things are like smaller than a match head. They are really, really, really tiny. They sort of just snap on. So you have to kind of be careful with those. All right, so let's do a rescan. And let's see what we get. Uh, okay, that's, that's entertaining. Hang on a second, let's see what's going on here oh okay so now um yeah we we should see a log mag effect and hang on let me make sure i've got these things connected down properly and do another sweep and I'm not seeing, I would expect to see around six and a half. I would expect to see a real sharp dip here. I don't think this is it right here. I would expect to see a sharp dip. Let's zoom in on the frequency range here a little bit. From three, let's make the upper end 10 megahertz. Hmm. Hang on a second. I can just sanity check something here. I've got my nano DNA upside down only because my computer is to my left and not to my right. And my USB connector is a little bit limited. So let's see. I had this working great this afternoon. Of course, you know, demo demons come out. You know what happens there. <laughs> so. so all right, we'll come back to this here if we've got a little bit of time. But um, normally you would see a notch right around six and a half megahertz. That's what we're looking for. But we'll see if we can make that happen here in a minute. But here's a, here's a real fun part, okay? Let's say you want to measure an inductor. Let's say you're... You know, winding inductors for building a little kit, a little uh, uh, QRP transmitter kit, okay? So let's take a typical inductor. So here's a typical hand-wound inductor. It's a red core, which is a type 2, mixed 2 type core. Uh, and this is a 68, T68, and it's an iron core. So it's not an FT, it's just T, T68-2. Uh, 68 means it's 0.68 inches across on the OD. And I've wound it with, I think this is uh, 18 gauge. No, it's 20 gauge, 20 gauge wire. Okay. So um, how do we do this? All right. Well, we do this by creating a either a series or parallel resonance circuit in line. Okay, so what we're going to do is we've got to have our our inline circuit here. And let me get my other clip lead back. Get that going. All right, this out of the way. And what we got to do is got to create. In this case, we're going to make a series connection circuit 
with a capacitor. Now, although I know I pulled this out of my bin and it should be approximately 100 picofarad, I have this handy dandy little device here that's called a component tester. Okay, and I just stick this in here, latch it down, press start, and it's going to try to decide what kind of component this is. And it says, aha, it's a capacitor, 95.28 picofarad. So 95 picofarad, okay? Now that we know we have a 95 picofarad capacitor, we've got one of the unknowns. And then we have a formula. Once we understand the resonant frequency of the circuit, we will know the other component, which is the inductor. So I've got this handy dandy little squeeze connector. This is a pair. So I'm just gonna connect these two leads together and I'm going to put my measurement leads across here, okay? And now I need to go to what's called phase. So I want to measure on the S11 channel, on channel one, I want to see where the phase flips from inductive to capacitive reactance. And at that exact place is where it will be, re that's the resonant point. And once we understand where it's resonant, we can back calculate exactly what kind of inductor it takes to be resonant at that point. Okay, so hold on. I'm not. I'm missing something here in my in the nano DNA. Oh, okay. For some reason, let me set this. Let me set up for nano DNA. I'm so used to running the nano directly on log mag that uh, let's see. Or on phase. Okay. So let's see if that picks it up. Uh, hold on a second. I've still got a lot to learn about the, uh, oh, hold on a second. I need S11 phase, that's the problem. I need S11 because it's port one I'm measuring up. Ah, there we go. That makes more sense. Dun, da, da, da. Okay, so. This point right here, does everybody see this point where it suddenly crosses over from capacitive to inductive reactants? Everybody see yeah. that? Yes. Okay. That phase crossover using the phase chart, okay? That frequency, that's, uh, let's see, zoom in here a little bit. Uh, that's exactly where I want, that's, so it's going to be between 7.48. Let me change my uh, scale again here. Back to 30 megahertz full sweep. What did I do? Did I lose it? Hang on a second. Okay, well, we'll just go with this for now, okay? So right now, it's approximately 7.48 megahertz is the resonance point. So this little series LC circuit right there, this little series LC circuit, boom, in here, with a capacitor in out, that guy on port one of my nano DNA is resonant at 7.48 megahertz. So now we use a handy dandy little chart I'm going to show you. A little table of formulas right here. So I'm going to, so this is being recorded. So you'll see this for the future. There's three ways that three things I can calculate. If I know the frequency, resonant frequency and the capacitance, I can measure the inductance. 
If I know the resonant frequency and the inductance, I can measure the capacitance. And if I know only the inductance and capacitance, I can predict what the resonant frequency is going to be. And inductance is in microhenries, capacitance is in picofarads, and frequency is in megahertz, which makes it really convenient. These numbers right here are uh, powers of 10 exponents. So this is 1 million, this is 1 millionth, and this is 1,000 right here. This means multiply it by 1,000, okay? Everybody with me? Mm -hmm. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to show you is I'm going to stop sharing that, and I'm going to start sharing a different screen, which is a spreadsheet. And a spreadsheet is right there. All right, you guys see the spreadsheet? Yep. Okay, so mm -hmm. if I know what the capacitance is, 95 picofarad, and I know my resonance is, what did I say, 7.45? Look, it gave me the inductance, 4.8 microhenries. So this little guy is 4.8 microhenries. Isn't that cool? So you can be pretty... Pretty assured, if you've got confidence in your capacitance value, you can be pretty assured of what kind of inductance you've got. So let's try this big bad boy here, this big fat double wound one. Let's see what kind of inductance we can get out of this boy. Okay, all right. So we have to go back and let me switch back to our. DNA saver, which is right. Uh, let's see. Where the heck is DNA? Ah, here we go. I've got so many screens on my desktop here. Okay, so let's do another sweep. And Let's see here. Aha. Now we've got a big phase change down here at this different frequency. Okay. So that is going to be around 5.87 megahertz. So let's put that into our equation. I don't have to switch back. You've seen this game. 5.87 megahertz. And now this tells me it's a 7.738 microhenry inductor. So that's how you measure inductors. When you want to build a QRP radio or a filter or uh, you know, a diplexer, a duplexer, a whole bunch of stuff with LC circuits. This is how you measure it, not how you build it. So questions? So you have to know the capacitance first before you can figure out the inductance in this, of, in this of case. Of course. Okay. Okay. Uh, Rudy, a uh, question. No, sure. Not, not exactly related, but can we use the nano VNA to measure the self-resonant frequency of an inductor? Uh, well, this, when you say the self-resonant, are you assuming that you can measure it directly with the nano DNA? That's what I'm wondering. Like, you know, an induct most inductors will have a, a frequency that they will resonate on with no capacitance added to them because of the turn-to-turn -turn capacitance. And you normally want the self-resonant frequency to be much higher than what you're designing the inductor for. So I'm wondering, can we use the nano VNA to determine the self-resonant frequency of an inductor? Well, um, I would say caution because uh, you're going to have a lot of stray capacitances in a raw, in, in just a pure raw inductor by measuring it like this. Okay? Okay. And if you were to do that, let's see what we get. See, I like the nano because I don't have to keep doing a rescan. So this would indicate there's a resonance 
self resonance up here at 6.5 megahertz. Oh, okay. That's cool. That's very cool. Yeah. So it is a sanity check, but the problem when you don't have a known capacitance in a circuit that basically uh, dominates stray capacitance that might be there, much smaller stray capacitances, then the stray capacitances can get involved and not be the direct reading. For example, this is not going to be a, you can't measure the uh, inductance this way. All right, no. you cannot trust it. It's You're gonna get a bogus number. Sure, I got that, yeah. You have to have it in some kind of a series or parallel circuit. And the, by the way, the formula is applied to both series and parallel circuits. It's, they're the same formula, okay? Mm -hmm. Right. So it doesn't mean, matter how you hook it up, in series or in parallel. And I find it's easier in series. So uh, that's what you really wanna do. Now, here's another tip. You ask yourself, what kind of value capacitor do I wanna use? Well, um, you can look at the frequency range of resonance that you're expecting, okay? Or at least the inductor that you're expecting. So if you go back, for example, to let me stop sharing the VNA saver and let me go back to the spreadsheet right here. All right. And you ask yourself, okay, rather than a 95 picofarad capacitor, if I put a thousand picofarad capacitor in there, okay? and I'm at the same resonance, then the inductor is gonna be down, it's gonna think it's a 0 0.75, 735 microhenry inductor, all right? So if, however, I expect it to have a um, resonance of, let's just say 14 megahertz, all right? And I've got an inductor that I think is a one microhenry, then it, it's going to take 129 picofarads to make it resonant at 14 megahertz. If I make that much, much bigger, oh, hold on a second. I need to back up a second. Didn't want to do that. If I make this, uh, if I change this to 14 megahertz, all right, and if I change this down to 100, picofarad, you see the inductor goes up. If I change this to 10 picofarad, then for that resonant frequency, the inductor goes way higher. So what I'm saying is you have to kind of keep in mind the balance of the expected frequency you want to test this at, test the inductor at, all right, and uh, the frequency, uh, reasonable frequency range that you got calibrated in your nano VNA somewhere in the middle, and pick a capacitor that would put you in the ballpark so that when you measure it with that capacitor, it's going to give you that uh, that resonance, that phase flip that you see up here, okay? You're going to get that phase flip that you would expect. Make sense? Yep. Okay, so that's pretty much what I've got for you guys tonight. Um, there's other things you can do with the nano VNA, like uh, uh, time to main reflectometry by testing coax cables for opens and shorts and length. Uh, and you can read about that online. It's pretty cool, but it takes a little setting up of the nano VNA to do that. We're not going to do that tonight. I wanted to focus on things that you most people are likely to be doing, especially experimenters and hobbyists. Uh, common load chokes, balance, uh, resonance circuits, and uh, measuring inductors. So open it up for questions. So if I was trying to design a low pass filter for 10 meters for a linear amplifier, it, it sounds to me like the nano VNA would work really well for checking that out. Would that be true? Absolutely. First of all, it'd be great to actually measure the inductors that you're winding for that guy, right. okay? And secondly, uh, it's great to test it on, then you would use it at the end, of course, a low pass filter, you'd have to run it on the through mode. So from the input to the output here, right. and you'd put it on log mag, and you would see the performance, right? You would see yeah. 
the the db performance across your frequency range of that low pass filter and you would expect to see a low pass filter here's the we have got a diagram of a low pass filter right here's a low pass filter it's it's good 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 then it drops off right high pass filter is it comes up to a point and flattens out right okay. it, it suppresses the low for high pass passes the high frequency suppressing the low low pass filter just the opposite yeah so, now, uh, something I want to share with you that's kind of fun is uh, I encourage you to have some fun with this with a Lego kit. And I want to show you what uh, what I recommend. Let me go here to our friends at Amazon. Okay. And let me share the screen here. Where's my Amazon? We're going to play with Legos? Oh, cool. Yeah. <laughs> Electronic equivalent of Legos. All right, check this out. This is a assortment pack. Yep. Of high, high voltage capacitors, three kilovolts, which is good for typically 100 watts. Well, three kilovolts will handle 100 watts. Okay. But with your nano VNA, if you just want to test circuits and get an understanding of LC circuits for filters, for diplexers, duplexers, um, you know, anything along those lines that you want, or a tuner, a little micro tuner, and you want to really understand what values, not power rating, okay, that's the only thing that scales up the component at that point, with the same value rating, right? A one micro Henry can be very small, or a one microhenry can be really big. It's just the power rating, but it's still one microhenry. So you can play with the micro picofarads and microhenries at a very small scale on a little breadboard, right? Everybody's seen the solderless breadboards I've talked about before, right? Everybody know what I'm talking about? Yes? No? Hmm? Hello? Yes. Has yes. anybody not seen a solderless breadboard? Does, does butter come with that breadboard? <laughs> no. <grape> jelly. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Anyway, um, so you can use a little solderless breadboard because at these frequencies, uh, you can actually get pretty good results. I wouldn't expect to do that at VHF or UHF frequencies or higher. Uh, things, straight capacitances really come into play there. But at HF, it's extremely forgiving. It's really quite wonderful. So you can get yourself for like, what is this? 10 bucks. Mm -hmm. Get yourself a pack of an assortment of capacitors. If you want to build balance, this is what you'd use on the front end of the uh, balance or anon at the input side to get it really nailed down to dial out that little last inductive reactance. And then uh, to match that, I would look at getting one of these, which is a... Let's see if it comes, there we go, uh, zoom in. So this is an inductor set. So it's an inductor kit that goes from one microhenry up to, uh, I think a couple hundred millihenries, if I'm not mistaken. Let's see, let me go down here and see. Uh, 4.7 millihenries from one microhenry to 4.7 millihenries. So you can actually play around with making little tuners uh, little uh, counterpoise, uh, ground tuners with this. You can experiment with, uh, if you wanted to build yourself a micro miniature uh, auto tuner and uh, and play with that if you wanted to, with some relays. So um, it's, it's just great fun. They also have a resistor assortment uh, that you can find on Amazon. Uh, I'll show you one right here. This is a resistor pack, 21 bucks. You get 2,600 resistors of 130 different values, a uh, quarter watt. So uh, speaking, that, speaking of resistors, uh, Rudy, yeah. we are at the top of the hour. Ah, okay, cool. So do you gentlemen have any other questions for the, our antenna whisperer? We don't want to keep you too much. I just want to tell you that uh, the, the Golden Knights are leading seven to two, and there's a minute and eight seconds left. So um, it has been a very good evening, <laughs> not only for Rudy and his uh, explanation and demonstrations, excuse me, his cavalcade of demonstrations.
<laughs> as as well as um, uh, for the Golden Knights. So uh, that is something to look forward to. I'm sure that they had a resonant frequency that was quite high tonight. <laughs> <laughs> so, all right guys so any last minute questions or comments i just want to say thank you rudy we really appreciate it and and rudy what is podcast number six for the month of july i'm looking at doing easy neck antenna modeling for beginners very good excellent because that sounds pretty good uh, yeah uh, that is the third corner of the triad. The triad is the nano DNA with SimSmith, which both of which you've seen now, and then with the easy neck basic understanding of how to do basic modeling, you'll be able to model an antenna before you even spend a lot of time messing around building anything. You model it, analyze it, push it around, and go, oh, no, this is actually worth trying to build now. And chances are when you build it, you're going to be fairly close. You're going to be in the ballpark. And then you can tweak it for real life, you know, components mm -hmm. and capacitances and stratus and resistances that uh, and dial it in. Excellent. And then you measure it, then you measure with the nano VNA, you import it into Sim Smith and analyze the hell out of it, and then you can tweak it. So it's and then you go back after you tweak it, you can redesign your antenna again. And uh, Easy Next output goes straight into SimSmith as well. So you can actually see exactly live in SimSmith what's happening when you make changes in Easy Neck. It updates automatically. Excellent. So we'll be looking for that. The next uh, podcast, or excuse me, the next uh, Zoom is technically scheduled for Monday, July 3rd, which, of course, is the first Monday of July. So everybody look for the note on that and definitely check out uh, the Antenna Whisperer on YouTube. And you will be up to date on that. And he's got a lot of other stuff up there, too. Make sure you catch on that. So, everybody, thank you very much. Rudy, it was exceptional tonight. And we will see everybody all through the month. Take care and catch you on the airwaves. 73, right, everybody. 73, guys. 73. Hey.